Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? It's Monday. It's a little rainy. It's math class. That's practically sedation enough for surgery, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, just some reminders. Uh, <clears throat> so, Quiz 12 is presently running. That is to say, Quiz 12 is the one that you must take by Saturday. Then next week, Quiz 13 will be running, and that's the end of the semester. Right? So, remember, recall the way that we do things is that um, you know we lecture this week, we homework over we homework over it the next week, and then we we quiz over it the next next week. So quizzing is always offset by two weeks. As a result, today is the first day of material that there won't be a quiz over before the final. Simply for lack of time. So the way the final exam will work is we're still going to lecture for the next two weeks and it's still going to be tested but the first time you're gonna have a quiz like question that is to say a proctored question the first and only time is gonna be on the final exam now there'll be written homeworks and there'll be and there'll be videos and you can look at those and the quiz questions will indeed be pulled more or less from the written homework question just like it's always been but uh, that'll be the final exam will be the first and only time you get a stab at these questions okay so then the final exam will still have the same redo flavor that the midterm exam did uh, the final exam is going to be like quizzes something like I think 8 through 13 are the ones for which there will be a, re a redo opportunity quizzes 8 through 13. But then the material corresponding to this week and next week, you'll see, you'll have quiz questions just once at, at, the, at the final exam. But any questions about the way the rest of the semester will play out? Okay. So let's get to it. So we've been talking about the, you have a question? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's May the 4th, because I was planning on saying, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember making that decision back at the beginning of the semester, <laughs> that I was surely going to do that. <laughs> uh, but as for what time of day, I don't know. I think day of the week, that's a, that's a Thursday, I think. Other questions? Okay. So we've been talking about uh, polynomials. And we, we have broken their behavior into two <coughs> regimes, the global and the local regime. So the global behavior of polynomials uh, is characterized entirely by two properties of the polynomial. So, so all polynomials, their leading term is either even or odd degree. So even polynomials, the left and right behavior is the same. Their either branches are both up, both down. That's the only possibilities for the global behavior for even. Uh, for odd, it's one and one. So it's either like this or like that. It's got to be one or the other. <coughs> then you can establish the behavior of the right branch uh, by looking at the sign of the leading coefficient. If the leading coefficient is positive, the right branch is going up. If the leading coefficient is negative, the right branch is going down. So that is the entirety of the global behavior of polynomials. Then we have the local behavior, which I was colloquially referring to as the wiggle. You can, get a, you can determine a great deal about the local behavior of a polynomial by making a sign chart for it. A sign chart tells you that, okay, well, once you've established the global behavior, then you have to interpolate through the zeros, which is to say you have to draw through the zeros. And the sign chart tells you that when you come to a zero, you're either going to cross it, if the sign is changing from negative to positive or positive to negative. So if there's a sign change, you will cross. 
if there is not a sign change. Say, for example, the sign chart says positive, then positive, then negative, then positive. Well, with that double positive, you still have to come to the zero, but you won't cross. You'll bounce. Okay, so the sign chart tells you a great deal about what's happening locally. So we're going to finish our discussion of the local behavior of polynomials today. Okay. So here we go. So let's consider this polynomial. f of x is negative 4 x minus 3 squared multiplied by x plus 5. So now I want to ask you, how about the zeros? How many zeros does this polynomial have? In, in some sense, it has three. But so let me hedge a little bit and say, how many unique zeros does this have? Two, right? And what are they? Three, three and negative five. <coughs> and let's go over the language just one more time. It is a little bit strange, at least at first, to say that three is a zero, because surely three is equal to three, which is not zero. So why the language? To say why the language three is a zero. Exactly. So if we use three as input to the function, then what's the output? Zero. That's the that's the point of calling three a zero. Okay. So this factor here is the reason why we are saying 3 is a 0. And this other factor here is the reason we're saying that 5 is a, uh, negative 5 is a 0. <coughs> OK. Then I could ask, well, OK, what is the, what is the uh, parity? Of f. What's its parity? That is just okay. so it's got parity is even or odd, so it's got to be one of those. So which one is it? Even. Okay, what what leads you to say even? It's a quadratic, so it's a parabola. Okay, it's not a quadratic. It's definitely not. Oh, the greatest mystery. I don't know. So let's consider this this expression. This expression you could write it in the following way. You could say negative four, and then x minus 3 multiplied by another x minus 3 multiplied by x plus 5. Now, that's just a more, more verbose way to write what was up there. Okay. Now, if you were to multiply out this and collect like terms, what is the highest degree you would obtain? You'd, you'd obtain a cube, right? You'd obtain x to 3 because there's 3 of these factors. So the fact that there are three factors, one, two, three, those there's three factors, and therefore it's degree three, and therefore it's odd parity. Any question about this? So we know we know the zeros, we know the parity. Uh, so in particular, vi visually, visually, this is telling us that this polynomial is one of these two. It's either going to be like this one, or it's going to be like this one. <coughs> because it has odd. Uh, because it's degree three, <coughs> odd parity. You can ask another question. We can say, okay, well, what is the sign of the leading coefficient? Well, how 
How about it? It's negative. Why is the sine of the leading coefficient negative? It beca because it is, in fact, negative 4, right? If you were to multiply this all out and collect like terms, the leading term would be x cubed, and its coefficient would be negative 4. So the sine of the leading coefficient is negative. And what that, what that does for us is it, it disambiguates between these two. It chooses which one. So which one is it? The left one, right? It's this one. So we know that the shape, so it's got to be this one. We know that the shape looks like this. <clears throat> but what I want to get across to you, now we're at a place where there's actually an ambi a slight ambiguity. Slight ambiguity. So if you make a sketch, sketch. This. If you make a sketch, then because of this, we know two points that are definitely on the sketch. What two points are definitely on the sketch? Yeah, these zeros, right? That is to say, there's got to be a point on the x-axis at x is negative 5, and there's got to be a point on the x-axis at x is 3. So, negative 5 and 3, negative 5 and 3. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two sketches, and I want you to tell me which sketch is the correct sketch. So here's one possibility. And here's the other. Now what's the distinction between them? So they both look like this, right? They're both odd, and they both have the right branch going down. So they're both like that. What's the distinction? I like that. Notice that the sign chart of this one would be positive, positive, negative, whereas the sign chart for this one would be positive, negative, positive. I like that. So we, we, in, in that way, if you were to make a sign chart, you could decide between these two. But I claim that even without making a sign chart, you can still decide between these two. <coughs> you can still decide. It has to do with, notice what's happening if we compare the, the negative 5, say. Notice that the drawing on the left, when we're going to the 0, we bounce off it. We bounce off the negative 5. Whereas this one over here, we cross through the negative 5. And for the 3, for this one, we cross through the 3. And for this one, we bounce off the 3. But for such a situation, if you've got just two zeros and you've got to look like that, it's got to be one or the other. You have to bounce off one and cross the other. You can't do anything else. So which one is supposed to get the bounce? And why? Three. The three. The three is supposed to get the bounce. Why is the 3 supposed to be the one that gets the bounce? Exactly. So have a look at this one. Notice that 
locally, that is to say, if you ignore all the other stuff, that is like x minus 3 squared. Well, that means that it should, it should be like a parabola. <coughs> so that means that that's the one that should, should get the bounce. So this is, this, this is the very last thing we said on Friday, and that is take a look at this 0. So if you cut out that box and just look at it, that is the look of an even 0. because you bounce off the x-axis. And similarly, here, this is the look of an odd zero, because you cross. So, what I'm saying is the fact that this two, that, that that is two, is saying that that has to be even. So even without making a sign chart, you can, you can make, you can still distinguish it. Nice. Similarly, uh, in the formula you can see, well, x minus 3 has exponent 2, so it's going to have this even behavior. Why is this one going to have odd behavior? What is its implied exponent? 1, right? which is, of course, an odd number. <coughs> OK. That's interesting. So for that reason, for that reason, we have the following. And the following terminology, which is called multiplicity. Let x equal to c be a 0. of polynomial polynomial f of x. So now I'm going to write parenthetically something that is implied by this. So what that means is that x minus c is a factor. And then I'll say at least once. So now I'm going to say at least once because notice that we're saying for the, in the previous example that 3 is a 0. And then if I cover up all this stuff and that's all, and you could only see that 3 is a 0, that's telling you that x minus 3 is a factor. But it doesn't, f it doesn't further inform you just how many times it is a factor. So 3 is a 0 and negative 5 is a 0. But we don't know how many times they appear. But then I remove my, you know, I reveal. And then, oh, OK, x minus 3 is a factor once, twice. And x plus 5 is a factor just once. OK. So let x equal to c be a 0 of the polynomial f of x. If the factor x minus c appears exactly in times then x equal to c is a 0 of multiplicity n. 
So that is to say, for example, in this exercise, 3 is a 0. What is the multiplicity of 3? 2. And in this same exercise, negative 5 is a 0. What is the multiplicity of negative 5? 1, because it appears once. So multiplicity is just a name for this counting thing. Negative 3 has multiplicity 2, and negative 5 has multiplicity 1. OK. So I could say, well, how about mm, I give you p of x is, um, <coughs> say, x squared times x minus uh, 4 squared multiplied by x plus 1 cubed. Then I could ask, uh, please fill out the following table. <coughs> that is to say, I want you to make a table of the zeros and also tell me their multiplicities. So 4 is a 0. Do we all agree that 4 is a 0? What's its multiplicity? 2. Are there any other zeros? Negative 1 is a 0. What is its multiplicity? 3. Are there any other zeros? 0 is a 0. Remember, to be a 0, means that that is an input that produces output 0. So if you input 0, then that factor is 0, and it doesn't make any difference what the others are. What is the multiplicity of 0 as a 0? 2. Any question about this? So now, what is the degree of this polynomial? So I could say that that was question 1. I'm going to say question 2. What is the degree of P? So what is its degree? 7. And how did you come to this? Very good. It's the sum of these multiplicities. So now I'll just ask out loud, um, what's the parity of this polynomial? Odd. What is the sign of its leading coefficient? Positive. So you know the global shape of this polynomial. So now I want you to pr produce a sketch. So in particular, because you know its global shape, its global shape has simply must look like this. So blah, wiggle, blah. It's got to look like that. But now I want you to sketch, and I want you to have the zeros correct. Now because of the zeros, we know that uh, we know three points that simply must be on the plot. So uh, 4, 0 has to be on the plot. 0, 0 has to be on the plot. And so does negative 1, 0. Those all have to be on there. But now, 
using multiplicity alone, I want you to interpolate this correctly. So, because, because we know that the overall shape looks like this, we know we've got to start down here-ish, and we've got to end up here-ish. Right? It's got to be that way. <coughs> so how do you... How do you interpolate through these zeros and get it right? Now you could answer the question more or less with a sign chart, but, let, but I claim you can do it even without one now. Okay, so you say it's got to bounce off negative one. I, I disagree. It can't bounce. Oh, I switched the. <coughs> I switched zero. Okay. okay, okay. So, so it's got to cross zero. Why must why must it cross? Uh, sorry, it must cross here at at this zero. Why must it cross at this zero? Because its multiplicity is odd. That's an odd zero, so that's a crossing. So that means we're going to come up from the depths here. We're going to come up to one, and we're going to cross. So we cross. Now, I've got to, I've got to bend back down to that zero. As for that zero, will we cross there, or will we bounce off? We'll bounce off. Why must we bounce? because zero has even multiplicity, so we'll bounce off of it. So we bend back down to it, yet bounce off of it. Now we've got to make it down back to the four also. When we get to it, when we get to this zero, will we cross or will we bounce off of it? We'll bounce off. But now for, for two reasons we'll bounce off. What two reasons? will force us to bounce off. Parity, surely, because the parity is saying that uh, that zero has even parity, that, that four has even parity as a zero. But, but even ignoring that, there's even another reason why we simply must bounce off. Where are we supposed to end? supposed to end high. If you cross, if you go under the axis that to end high, you'd eventually have to go up again and you'd cross again, <coughs> but there's no other crossings. So there's a variety of reasons now that it must simply do this kind of thing. Interesting. Any questions about these? Now let's have a thought experiment. <coughs> About turning points. Uh, could you please briefly remind us what is a turning point? The, the local mins and maxes, the peaks and the valleys. Okay, so let's consider a straight line that, that has slope. Well, how many turning points does this have? So how many? Zero. Zero can't have any, right? That is to say, if it was raining, where would the water get, get, get caught? Nowhere, right? <laughs> it would just, just straight on down. Okay, two. 
every polynomial of degree 2 has to look like a what? A parabola. So they all either open down or up. But in either case, down or up, what's the number of turning points? Just one. <coughs> Notably, for parabolas, it's not possible to have any less than one. Because if you had any less than one, you wouldn't be a parabola. Three. There's two possibilities now. So the standard cubic looks like this. That's what the standard cubic looks like. Now how many turning points does the standard cubic have? Not this one. I'll make it have two in a minute. But this one has zero, right? Which is to say, if it were raining, where would the water get stuck? Nowhere, if it was raining down. What about if it was raining up? <laughs> if you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> where would the water get stuck? Nowhere. Okay, but, but, cubics are more interesting creatures than this, because if you take, say, x cubed, and you add to it something of degree one, it's still a cubic polynomial, because it's just the biggest one that matters. So what I want you to think about is what if, what if we take the standard cubic, which looks like this, and we add to it a straight line that looks like this. So the result will still be a cubic because it'll be a polynomial of degree 3 plus a polynomial of degree 1, which is still a polynomial of degree 3. But what I want you to observe is that here at that green point and at this analogous green point, the cubic is quite flat at that green point, whereas the line is not flat. The cubic is moving slowly near the green point in comparison to the line which is moving quickly. And you get far away from the green point, then now the cubic is moving fast and the line is moving slow. As a result, if you add these two together, you will observe something that looks like this. which is to say, notice that if you're far away from the green point, the sum looks more or less just like the cubic, if you're far away from the green point. Whereas if you're near the green point, it looks more or less just like the line. Near, far, near, far. Okay. How many turning points does this one have? Two. Okay. The standard quartic looks like the parabola, but it is quite steep <coughs> away from the origin and then quite flat near the origin. So it looks like this. So it's like the parabola, but, but more like that. So how many turning points does this one have? It's not exactly flat. So it comes to this right here. This is the one place where water would get caught. So there's one turning point. So now I'd like for you to imagine that we take the standard quartic, and there's the origin right there, and then we add to it 
the standard parabola turned upside down. And what I want you to observe about this is that near the origin, the quartic is, is flat. So it doesn't, it doesn't have very much action near the origin, and it, especially in comparison to the parabola. So what will happen when you add these two is you will get a plot that now looks like this. which is to say near uh, away from the origin it looks more or less just like the quartic however near the origin quite similar to the parabola interesting near far near far okay What's the number of turning points here? Three. Three. So now that we've drawn a few examples, let's see if you can generalize. So for a line, the maximum number of turning points is zero. You can't get any more. For a parabola, the maximum number of turning points is one. You cannot get any more. For a cubic, it is conceivable that you could have zero turning points, but the maximum achievable number of turning points for a cubic is two. You can't get any more. For a quartic, uh, I wrote two. Huh. I'm not sure. I hope I said one the first time, but surely there's just one. Okay, so for a quartic, it's conceivable you could have as few as one turning point. But you can have at most how many? Three. You can't get any more from a quartic. So would anyone care to make a, hyp a hypo hypothesis, a generalization? Supposing, so, supposing you have a polynomial of degree seven. What's the maximum number of turning points you could achieve? Six. You couldn't get any more. So if you had a polynomial of degree n, what's the maximum number of turning points? n minus one. So a polynomial of degree n has at most n minus 1 turning points. So now, English is an SVO language. What does that mean, SVO? By the way, from grade school. Old grammar with, with Mrs. Harris or whatever. SVO. Subject, verb, ob object, right? SVO. Other languages are different, possibly. Right? Chinese is also SVO. But Turkish, for example, is SOV. Whatever. So if you, if you switch the positions of subject and object in this um, sentence, then you get another sentence which is logically equivalent, but quite important. So let's switch the subject and the object around and say a polynomial with in turning points has degree at least what? That is to say, for example, if you witness a polynomial that has three turning points, what is the minimum possible degree of this polynomial? Four. It's got to be at least degree four. So, for example, here, you know, you can imagine this, this one right there that, that you can see. 
We've drawn it so many times in this class, you can probably imagine that I had in mind a parabola. How many turning points does that parabola have? One. And what is the degree of a parabola? Two. If you witness three turning points, the minimum possible degree is one more than that. Four. So n plus one. Any question about this? So I could draw for you an example. So these, the red sentence and the green sentence have the same logical content. Uh, I could draw for you an example. number of questions I could ask now. I could say, well, as for this polynomial, what is its, uh, what is the polynomial parity? Here, red T. So what's the parity of this polynomial? Odd. Because you cover up the local behavior and ah, the global behavior is opposite. So it must be odd. Uh, what is the sign of the leading coefficient? Got to be negative, which is to say you cover up everything except the rightmost behavior. Going down, got to be negative. Okay, I could ask you to count the number of zeros. So how many zeros? One. I could ask you to, to um, label these zeros and I also want you to give give their parity so that is to say that here is a zero right there so I'll mark it with a Z but you should be able also to tell me the parity of that zero what is the parity of that zero odd and what is your signal that the parity of this zero is odd because it crosses so this is a zero of odd parity. Then I could ask you to count for me. Please tell me the number of turning points. Well, and also label them, mark them. So how many turning points? Four, right? So here they are. One, two, three, four. So any question about finding the turning points? Okay, so then I could ask, well, considering all this information, what is the minimum possible degree of this polynomial? Five. It's got to be at least degree five. Why must it be at least degree five? There's four turning points. Okay. Could it be degree six? Nope. Couldn't be degree six, to which you might object. I'm pretty sure that six is more than four. <laughs> and I have no objection to that. But why could it not possibly be degree six? Because six is even. And this is clearly an odd polynomial. So if we could somehow establish that it is not degree 5, then what is the next minimum possible degree? 7. Because it simply must be odd. Any question about this? Okay. <coughs> Now a similar thought experiment. This is a polynomial of degree 1, a 
line. A polynomial of degree 2 must look like a parabola. A polynomial of degree 3 looks like a cubic. And as far as the number of turning points are concerned, there's two possibilities. You either have zero turning points or two turning points. So I'm going to draw the one with two for a reason that will be clear in a moment. Polynomial degree four, those are cortex. Uh, and I'm going to draw the cortex that has three turning points. Okay. Now, what I want you to imagine for each one now, I want you to draw a horizontal line that achieves the maximum number of intersections. <laughs> So for, th for this line right here, I want you to draw a horizontal line. What is the maximum achievable number of intersections for a horizontal line for this? One. And, it's, and it is achieved, for example, right here. One intersection. So how about for the parabola? What is the maximum achievable intersections? Two. Notably, you could achieve less, right? Because if you were to take this and pull it down to the vertex, then you'd get just one. And if you were to pull it any further, you'd get none. But I'm asking for the maximum achievable. So how about for the cubic? What's the maximum achievable number of intersections? Three. Now, you could achieve a different number, but this is the maximum you could achieve. You could achieve a different number by pulling this line down so that it touches just that one point at the turning point, and over here you could get two, and you could pull it down further and get just one. Is it possible to get any less than one? No, you can't do any less than one, and the maximum you can achieve is three. And finally, for reasons that I think are clear probably, for this one you can achieve four. So. Supposing now that each green one, each green horizontal line represents the horizontal axis, how many zeros does this have? One. And this one? Two. And this one? And this one? Okay, so then supposing that we have a polynomial of degree n, what is the maximum number of zeros you can achieve? n. So a polynomial of degree n has at most n zeros. So now, doing the same SVO o uh, uh, OVS trick, you can say a polynomial <coughs> with uh, n zeros is what? Yes, at least degree n. So notice the distinction between at most and at least. So a degree n, so to be clear, here's a cubic. And I've drawn for you an axis that gives it three zeros. One, two, three. But if I grab this, this and pull it down to be down here, there'd be just one zero. But it is still degree three. So that's the meaning of the at most. Similarly, here's a polynomial that, say, is of degree five. It still has just one zero. But if you draw a polynomial and it achieves four zeros, it must be at least degree four. Okay, good. So last topic, and I just want to introduce it so that 
we can jump right into it on Wednesday. So this is going back to grade school now, uh, to, to introduce the topic anyway. So hopefully you had an experience like this in third grade or so, that you walk in and you're starting the math lesson and then everyone has 20 M&Ms on their desk. And as a third grader, you can tell that this is gonna be good. <laughs> this is gonna be terrific. Okay, and then the teacher says, okay class, Everyone has 20 M&Ms. I want you to break these 20, 20 M&Ms into groups of size six. Well, how many groups of size six can you make? Three groups of size six. And then there comes a point where you can make no more groups of size six. How many are left over when you do this? Two, right? And then you do that a number of times with different numbers and then you get to eat the M&Ms and then you start doing this. You say, okay class. 20 is inside of the house and 6 is outside and 6 wants to come in. <laughs> How many times can 6 go into 20? Th 3 times and then you take this and do this and that and there's the 3 and the 2 from the M&Ms we were just talking about. What's the name for this bit? quotient and what's the name for this bit remainder. remainder so computing the quotient and remainder we're going to do exactly this on Wednesday except we're going to do it instead of with integers we're going to do it with polynomials and it's going to it, it, it's going to be as good as it sounds <laughs> see you then <coughs>